Good morning, Morgan. Today is Monday, March 15th, 2032. In the year 1955, the space race began between the Soviet Union and the United States in full force, with both countries launching satellites and eventually targeting manned missions to the moon. But in 1960, a hidden Soviet communications satellite named Verona-1 immediately ceases transmissions with ground control. Unbeknownst to the Soviets on the Earth at the time, Verona had just made first contact with non-terrestrial organisms codenamed Typhon, which had slaughtered the crew in an instant. And so marks the beginning of Prey, the most underrated video game of all time, that's hiding some of the most disturbing, insane, and crazy lore and theories you've ever seen. Buckle up. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? For those of you who don't know what an iceberg is, it's a deep dive into the strangest and most interesting lore and theories in the series, and Prey has that in spades. But my icebergs specifically are a little different, as I try to make sure every single theory is interesting and as in-depth as possible instead of just trying to go down a pre-made list. And for Prey especially, we have some really cool revelations throughout this entire video. So sit back and enjoy, and as always, thank you guys so much for all the support. Phantoms are one of the most common and horrifying enemy types we encounter in all of Prey, and are formed from weaver typhons when they find dead and rotting human corpses, which they then swiftly turn into monsters that we know and love. While the standard phantoms frequent Talos 1 throughout the game, there's also many lesser known and more rare variants as well, like the thermal phantoms that raise fire from the ground, the voltaic phantoms which shoot electrical bolts, and the etheric phantoms which fire off large kinetic blasts. Potentially the most haunting thing about the phantoms in Prey though, has nothing to do with their extraordinary abilities in combat, but rather their haunting voices. You see, it's not uncommon when playing the game that you will hear what sounds like strange hums, screams, and screeches coming from the phantoms hiding in rooms close by. But what a lot of players might not know is that by specking deeper and deeper into the typhon based abilities in game, these horrifying screams start to become more coherent. Are you angry? Morgan? What does it look like? The shape in the glass? What was originally scary sounds becomes even more horrifying when we hear the Phantom start to make remarks about Morgan himself and what is going on in the station. Which makes perfect sense considering taking too many Typhon based neuromods in game starts to change Morgan into a Typhon himself. Which is by the way also why security turrets and operators on the station begin to attack you if you level up too many times into Typhon based skill. This starts to make us ask the question though then, are these phantoms sentient? Why are they trying to communicate with us in the first place? Some theories postulate that these phantoms are merely repeating words and phrases they have heard from other people on the station, or even mimicking the speech patterns of the hosts they originally took over. We can see examples of this where phrases we hear from the psychologist speaking to phantom subjects can be heard being repeated by the phantoms over and over in game. You seem frustrated. You seem frustrated. But then how are some phantoms saying things like, what does it look like? The shape in the glass, which is an obvious reference to the ending of the game where we find out everything has been a looking glass simulation. So maybe then the phantoms are actually just glitching out in the simulation itself? But then how could Morgan's memories still see so many human-like behaviors from the phantoms in the first place? A perfect example of this comes from one of my recent streams, where we actually found a phantom that became scared of Morgan and tried to hide in a corner. I'm glad you guys like the wrench, by the way. All right, that guy just teleported away. That's no fun. He's definitely hiding in the back. 100% about to just sneak up on me. There he is. Oh, he's hiding. What the hell? I almost feel bad for Yuri. He almost looks scared, though. Is that intentional? Oh, what do we got here? Either way, something weird is going on with the phantoms in the Prey universe, with my best guess being that their ability to take over hosts leaves them with some lingering side effects of the previous human's emotions and personality. But maybe the story goes even deeper, and the phantoms themselves are actually screaming out in pain for help from something. Could the phantoms actually be prisoners in their own body, whose minds are now melded with their horrified host? 
If there is in fact a way to bridge the gap between humanity and the biggest threat we've ever seen, Phantom's secret power and ability to take over a host in their mind is probably it. For anyone who is into immersive sims like I am, you probably have become intimately familiar with the number sequence 0451. For anyone that doesn't know, this secret passcode originally came from Looking Glass Studios and their cult classic System Shock, where the code 451 was required to get past the first door in game. This code, or some close version of it, was then used in the beginning sections of most of their titles going forward, like System Shock 2 and Thief. And to pay homage to this now lost and forgotten great game studio of old, many modern day studios that work on immersive sims like Eidos Montreal on Deus Ex, 2K Games on Bioshock, and Arcane Studios on Dishonored and Prey include the number on a beginning door in all of their games. In Prey specifically, we can find this sequence used to get into Morgan's office right at the start of the game, a perfect place to put it in my book. And speaking of books, it's been widely assumed that the reason this code was originally used was in reference to the famous novel Fahrenheit 451, which tells the story of a firefighter who is being forced to burn outlawed books, and is a cautionary tale about government overstepping their bounds and the importance of freedom and listening to others with ideas different than your own, something all of us could take a look at nowadays. However, what a lot of people don't know is that some developers in recent years have come out and said that the real inspiration for the secret code is actually just that 0451 was the passcode to get into the Looking Glass Studio headquarters in Cambridge, Massachusetts during their heyday. Either way, it's an awesome legacy for my personal favorite genre of games of all time. In my opinion, Prey has one of, if not the best, introduction sequences to a video game of all time, where a mysterious and relaxing day turns into a horrific and mind-bending twist. And in these beginning moments, at one point you enter a research facility where a group of scientists start to run a sequence of mundane tests on you before you presumably will be heading out into space. And in that last round of testing, right before a mimic appears and starts killing everyone, you are met with these two questions. A runaway train is bearing down on five people. You're standing on the platform next to an enormously fat man. Pushing him into the track will stop the train. Push the fat man, do nothing. Naturally, anyone with any sort of common sense and humor pushes the fat man here. But the next question only gets more crazy. A runaway train is bearing down on five people tied to a track. You could stop the train by jumping onto the track, but you would die. Jump on the tracks, push the fat man do nothing. Once again, the obviously correct answer here is to push the fat man, but regardless of what you pick, only moments after, the real game of Prey begins. The more interesting part about this entire sequence though is just how much it relates to the game as a whole and its deeper meaning. Because you see, the entire game of Prey is really at its core a game about choices and empathy, and how every choice you make can have drastic consequences. The choices to these prompts early on are reflected in the themes of the game later, with options to either sacrifice yourself for the greater good, or to cause chaos. And based on these choices, you will be judged in the final twist at the end of the game. In fact, there's even an achievement in the game called Push the Fat Man that players can get if they kill Alex Yu at the end of the game, which directly relates back to this questionnaire in Prey's opening. Where this connection starts to get absolutely insane, though, is the real-world parallel that almost no one knows about. Because you see, one of the founding members of Arcane Studios, the guys that made Prey, was actually the great-grandson of famous philosopher Philippa Foote, who originally created the now-renowned thought experiment called the Trolley Problem, that this Prey questionnaire is based on. Why this relates specifically to Prey, though, is because Philippa was a staunch supporter in her time of a cult called the Eternal Flame, based in northeastern Wyoming that had actually been disbanded by an FBI raid following a horrific event where Philippa and other cult members were said to have sacrificed a group of overweight civilians via a train in order to- <laughs> I'm just messing with you guys. While the actual events that take place during the story of Prey are fascinating in their own right, potentially the lore of what happened before the game takes place is even more interesting and most of the people who have played the games don't even know about it. You see, the universe of Prey is actually an alternative timeline of our real world, where in 1958, during the space race between the United States of America and the Soviet Union, the Soviets launched a satellite called Verona 1 into orbit. But two years later, in 1960, all transmission signals from the satellite immediately ceased, and so a secret covert ops mission was launched where the Soviets sent rescue probes into space to see what had happened 
only to discover that Verona 1 had actually made first contact with alien organisms called the Typhon, which had slaughtered all the cosmonauts on board. This discovery was kept top secret for two years, but eventually in 1962, realizing the threat that these alien life forms might pose, the Soviets reached out to John F. Kennedy for assistance from the Americans in figuring out this potentially massive threat. So in secret, behind the backs of the peoples in both opposing nations, the rival countries' main priorities became understanding this new alien force, which resulted in the founding of what was known as the Kletka program in 1963, which by the way in Russian means prison or gate. A massive space dome was constructed around the original Verona 1 satellite that still contained the living aliens on board, and this dome was meant to shield the rest of the world from the Typhon threat. But back on Earth, the Soviets betrayed the Americans and initiated a failed assassination attempt on JFK, which resulted in the Americans taking full control of the Kletka program and pushing the Soviets out. With their newfound complete control of what was the most mysterious power in the universe, the United States government launched a new top secret and highly funded program called Project Axiom. Massive mining and research operations were set up on the moon in order to gather the raw materials needed to construct a research station around the now-imprisoned Verona 1 satellite. And for decades after this, the United States studied the Typhons and their power, which is originally where the technology for the neuromods and so many other things in game came from. But in 1984, this massive research project was finally shut down after many years of deaths and near outbreaks, along with massive budget deficits and a concern from top government officials that the program was not yielding any beneficial results. So for over 40 years, the station sat dormant in space with no activity going on that we know of, until in 2025, the massive private company known as Transtar was able to outbid rival company Casma Corporation in order to obtain rights to the station. Morgan Yu, who we play as in-game, is actually the son of the founder of Transtar, with Alex Yu being our older brother who we talk to throughout the game. Now in full control, Transtar also resumed operations on the moon mining bases that had sat dormant since 1978, and started to build out yet another station around the previous two. This new space station was dubbed Talos-1, and served as a massive research facility and also lounge for Transtar employees and directors, along with anyone else visiting the new and improved station full of beautiful architecture that we see a lot of in-game. And this is where the story we actually play along in in Prey takes place, with the opening line of the game, Hello Morgan, today is March 15th, 2032, being the day that Morgan was sent to travel to Talos 1 in order to meet his brother regarding some of the research they were doing on the station. It's crazy just how awesome and deep a lot of the Prey lore is that many people don't even know about, because it really is some of the best and coolest sci-fi lore I've explored yet in my entire Iceberg series, with a massive set of three different space facilities built around one ancient Soviet satellite. And it also gives so much context to the game and why we see such a variety of places and styles the deeper we go into the station, and provides so many decades of rich lore and mystery to pull from. The first thing that most players do when they wake up as Morgan in his room in the beginning of Prey is run over to their computer and log in to check their emails to see what's going on. But for players paying especially close attention, you may have noticed that Morgan's password is actually FP Aradox question mark. For those that don't know, this is an obvious reference to the Fermi Paradox, which is a popular question in science that asks why we have not found any intelligent life yet even with the high likelihood that it should be occurring more often. We can even search Morgan's room more and find documents and books that directly talk about this weird conundrum, and the connections only get deeper too when we look at the posters in the room as well, which show diagrams of the Fermi Paradox, as well as references to the Drake Equation, which was a mathematical model meant to calculate the probabilities of aliens actually existing in the universe. It's a cool easter egg for those of you who missed it, and was our first endgame hint that something strange was about to happen. But for me, it's the poster near the front door that has me really intrigued, as it almost looks like an indication of how the Typhon may have arrived into our realm of existence. And if that is what this painting is of, could it be that the Typhon stem from some sort of alternate dimension of pure darkness from which they traverse to find us? Considering we have almost no idea where these aliens actually stem from, this poster may be our best indication. Anyone that has beat Prey should know that there are multiple endings to the game that can happen depending on the decisions you make throughout your entire playthrough. 
But maybe one of the coolest endings that many players have missed is the early escape pod you can unlock with the help of December. You see, by extending a bridge past Alex's suite and getting a key, you can actually end the game much earlier than expected. And what a lot of players might not know is you can actually end the game extremely early if you're smart enough and find a way to climb up to the escape pod without even extending the bridge with either your jetpack, parkour, or the glue cannon. If you do actually get this ending, January will warn you of the mistake you are making and you will be met with a black screen ending where you will ominously hear Alex say that this isn't the one before the game sends you back to your last save. This is actually the ending I got on my first playthrough super early and it really got me thinking as to what was going on. And honestly, I thought it was a great way to break expectations and give you a big hint as to what was going on really throughout the entire game and the simulation. Prey is a game full of different powers, many ways to play, and a variety of locations to check out. But just because the game has a lot to offer, doesn't also mean there isn't a lot of fascinating lost or cut content that never made it into the game in the first place. For example, in the game's files we can actually find tons of references to a massive gun called the Kazavor. It would have been a talking gun that had a bloodthirsty yet polite demeanor, and fired multiple homing explosive discs that could fly around the map and find targets to discombobulate. After killing enemies, the gun would announce its own heroics, and we can even find many of these voice lines in the files to this day as placeholders. Exiting slow wave sleep. No selector found. Framing new neural imprint. Imprint complete. Linking Kazaver hybrotic munition system to selector MU. Kazaver is awake. On top of this too, the gun would have had an associated quest line, where at one point, after killing too many enemies, the Kazavor would have asked the player to recycle itself in shame. After which you could either recycle it, fix it by installing an empathy override so it would kill again, or simply installing it into the core of a medical operator instead. It honestly sounds like it would have been an awesome quest in game, but sadly it was cut midway through development due to the team's feeling like it didn't really add much to the story. Another example of this is the concept and the storyboard art we can see for players dual wielding wrenches, which also was later determined to not be a worthwhile feature to work on. On the enemy's side, there were multiple ideas that were never used, like an etheric nightmare or cannibal typhons, which were supposedly mimics that would consume one another in order to create a greater phantom who was resistant to all damage types and had to be hit from behind. These cannibal typhons too were involved with cut neuromod content that would have given players the cannibal ability which allowed them to eat typhon material or potentially even human corpses to regain health. Another interesting cut neuromod was called Smoke Form, which would have allowed players to transform into a black mist that could fly around the space station at breakneck speeds, but was cut because it just didn't fit the gameplay style well enough and was too OP like say the fast paced teleporting in the Dishonored series, but on steroids. Overall, Prey is a type of game that excels in large part because of all of the options and freedom it gives you, and all the unexpected ways you can use your powers and abilities. And I hope one day if a sequel is made to this underrated gem, these ideas can be pushed even further. One of the main plot points throughout the story of Prey is the personality drift Morgan has aboard his time on Talos 1. You see, every time you install a neuromodded game, if those neuromods are later ever removed in the future, then the host will forget all of their memories during the time of having the augmentation, and wake up only remembering their life before. On top of this, extensive use of neuromods seems to have a drastic effect on human beings and their personalities. With multiple entries we find around terminals on Talos 1 not only talking about how Morgan has changed over time, but also how some subjects became completely different people entirely. We know that on March 15, 2032, Morgan first left his apartment to head to Talos 1, and we also know from recordings Alex shows us when we first got to the station that we agreed to undergo extensive neuromod testing to help Alex and Transtar with their research. But over time, it seems that Morgan's priorities changed. We know this because during the game, we actually meet three different operators that were originally created by Morgan at three separate times. The first being January, who was created in January 2033, and the following two being December and then October, who correspond to their names months in the previous year, 2032, the year Morgan boarded Talos 1. 
Where this gets really interesting though, is even though each of these three operators was originally created by Morgan, each also has a very different goal that they're trying to help Morgan achieve. The first operator constructed, October, would have been forged seven months after Morgan injected his first Neuromod, and this would have given ample time for personality drift to take shape. And this first operator tells Morgan that he should use the Null Wave device Alex constructed as a backup contingency in order to kill the Typhon on board and save humanity and more importantly, the research. But December, the next operator that Morgan created after having his memory wiped even more times, stresses that Morgan instead needs to escape and return to Earth to tell everyone of the horrible testing and research going on aboard Talos 1. That way it can be stopped. And it's the last operator that Morgan created and the first we meet in game that tells us that the only way to stop the Typhon is to blow up Talos 1 completely. So it's clear that over months of harsh testing and personality drift, Morgan has begun to believe more and more that what was happening aboard Talos 1 was pure evil, and that the only way to stop it was to end everything. Where this theory starts to get super interesting though, is that some in the community have begun to believe that January was actually the one that caused the Typhon outbreak on Talos 1 in the first place. You see, in the beginning of the game we escape from our prison simulation we have been living out every day for months now. But the reason that is, is because before that, a Typhon outbreak on Talos 1 happened and caused the entire station to go into chaos, which means when we wake up, there's no one to do testing and instead, we break out. But the even more peculiar thing is that when we first wake up post Typhon break, the first person we talk to is January. Immediately after waking up, we start getting calls from this mysterious figure telling us we need to talk to him, and after we do, he reveals that a previous version of ourselves instructed him to blow up the station. It's almost too strong of a coincidence and makes us begin to wonder if January may actually be behind everything happening. After all, January seems hellbent on this goal of taking down the Typhon, and it's clear it is hiding some of the truth from us in order to get that done. So could it be that January was actually the one that caused the Typhon to escape and kill everyone on board Talos 1? After all, if January's main directive was to destroy the station, he would know he would need Morgan and his arming key in order to initiate the self-destruct sequence, but in order to actually get to Morgan, he would need a way to break him out of the grasp of the other scientists, and what better way to do that than causing an outbreak on the station and then leading Morgan to his safety away from the simulation. This may even imply that Morgan intended for January to do this, and would mean that we as the player are the ones that are responsible for the original Typhon outbreak, in an attempt to make sure we could escape and blow it all up in a future version of ourselves. Disregarding the fact that this is just awesome sci-fi concepts all around, this theory gets absolutely insane when we start to take into account that everything we are seeing is actually just memories being fed to us from Alex at some point even further into the future. Which means there may have been even more operators and versions of Morgan that we never saw and were hidden from us. Because remember we learn at the end of the base game of Prey that everything we just experienced is a simulation in a simulation, and we are actually a phantom being fed human neuromods to bridge the gap between humanity and aliens. And this means that who Morgan really is and what his true intentions are have been completely lost to the memories of the past and the hellish madness wrought by the neuromod tech infecting us with the minds of other consciousness. Alex is feeding us real memories of the real Morgan's past, but only the ones he wants us to see, and all interpreted through the mind of an alien whose mind is bending to extensive neuromod use from a species it has never encountered and whose molecular structure is completely different. It's funny because to be honest when I first beat Prey, I thought the ending if anything was a little bit of a letdown. It was all just a dream, a lazy excuse for an ending in my book. But after learning more and more lore behind it all, it honestly might be one of the coolest science fiction twists I have seen in any medium ever, just because of how deep it goes and how interesting the implications of it are when you start to look at everything more closely. Arcane Studios are known for putting a lot of fun easter eggs and secrets all over their games, but probably one of my favorites is one from Prey where we can find this adorable fella. Found in the offices next to the atrium in the hardware labs, this lovable glue snowman can be found hidden in a back corner behind an assortment of office whiteboards and stacks of boxes, and on him he has a simple note that reads, Hello, my name is Mr. Gluey McGlueface. Oh bro, we're putting this in the iceberg. You guys were asking why everyone had gloves? This is why. Look, boys, they're, they're making little Mr. Gluey McGlue faces. 
Probably the best character I've met so far. Besides myself, obviously. I'm awesome. It looks like nothing more than a funny nod from the developers, and it was likely something constructed by the scientists on Talos 1 at some point as a fun gag using some of the tech they were developing. One interesting thing I noticed though is that Mr. Glueface's hands are actually baseball gloves, one of the trash items we find on dozens of dead bodies around the space station, and this makes me wonder if Mr. Gluey McGlueface may actually be hiding an army of offspring we just haven't found yet. Either way, he has my vote for best character in the game. Prey has what I think is one of the best introductions to a video game I have ever played. And at the very start of that, it takes us on a helicopter ride across a sprawling and futuristic city where we get to see a happy glimpse into what is about to become a horrible nightmare. But what a lot of players probably missed while on this helicopter ride is a one frame glitch near the start of the endeavor where most players probably wrote it off as a technical issue if they did happen to even see it at all. However, if we freeze frame on that one frame, we can actually see this, which is not a glitch in the game, but actually a very purposeful moment. As you can see, the helicopter is still perfectly in frame unaltered, with only the view outside becoming a blue sea of nothingness. You see, this is what happens when the looking glass, which is a piece of tech in game that projects anything onto a piece of glass making it look real, happens to glitch out. And as we learn only moments after this helicopter ride ends, the entire thing was fake, and instead you were in this room here surrounded by this looking glass tech being tricked into thinking you were still on Earth. So it's crazy to think that even before the big reveal happened at the start of Prey, we were being given these small hints as to what was really going on. And if you go back and start to play this intro with this new knowledge, you will start to also notice other things as well, like why the helipad is a specific size with the walls too high to climb that aren't made of real stone, but actually glass. As is common with games that don't reach astounding amounts of financial success, Arcane Studios was never able to develop all of the post-launch content they wanted to for Prey. Luckily for us though, the one big piece of DLC content we did get, Moon Crash, ended up being quite literally the best and most underrated DLC for any game of all time, at least in my opinion. What a lot of players don't know though is that there are some very strong indications there was a second DLC originally planned, and it sounds amazing. You see, in the game's files there are two books that have in their unique identifiers a reference to DLC hooks, with one being named DLC underscore hook 4 underscore moon base, and the other being named DLC underscore hook 1 underscore secret space station. One of these books, titled in-game Pioneers of Space Industry, tells the story of researchers on a moon base codenamed Pythias, and this turned out to be exactly what the Moon Crash DLC was about. But what about that other book? Titled Flight Log Scott Parker, it details what would have likely been the other planned Prey DLC we never got. And boy does it sound cool. Earth liftoff was at 0900. Conditions nominal. Pre-check certified, four executive passengers, mail cargo. Flight was uneventful until 11.33 when radar detected an unidentified shuttle approximately 30 degrees off flight path at 9,000 kilometers. Its drift and rotation indicated malfunctioning maneuvering thrusters. There was no answer to radio calls. Captain Cooper ordered a course adjustment to bring us alongside. As we maneuvered within 60 kilometers, a second shuttle appeared on radar in the vicinity of the drifting vessel. Transponders identified it as a military vessel. We received a radio message to resume our original heading immediately. Captain Cooper asked if assistance was required and the order from the military shuttle was repeated. All highly unusual, but then it got really strange. The captain spotted it first. There was a facility out there and it was running absolutely dark. No lights, radar transparent. We were too far to see any details, but it was big. Cooper snapped into action, punched in a course to Talos and fired the engines. We moved out as quickly as possible. Our passengers were clueless to the entire encounter. Our arrival at Talos went by smoothly and the passengers and cargo were delivered safely. So what exactly was this supposed military ship that the Earth flight came into contact with? And even more hauntingly, why were there no signals of life on board? Especially considering that they did in fact receive a transmission that would imply that other humans were captaining the vessel. But the whole ordeal just sounds terrifying, and even more so interesting. Potentially this could have been a horror DLC planned for Prey that would have taken us to an abandoned space station full of zombified humans and potentially some new Typhon organisms that had caused the chaos. Or maybe it would have just expanded the Prey lore more. After all, why is there a military vessel coming into contact with the ships headed to Talos 1 in the first place? 
Could it be that the governments on Earth are trying to spy on Transtar? Either way, it's sad that this DLC and the ideas the devs had for it will likely never see the light of day, with our only hope being that a sequel to Prey eventually gets announced and this abandoned and scary military ship idea can maybe make a comeback. And hey, I won't complain, considering just how good Moon Crash is, even on its own. We already talked about the passwords to Morgan's personal computer and office and why they are special, but potentially the best password of all relating to Morgan comes from his secretary. You see, if you take a short detour on your way to Morgan's office and game, right outside the front door is a computer and desk set up for his secretary. If you actually try to use the computer though, it's password protected, and at this point in the game you likely don't have the necessary hacking skill to get in. Luckily for us though, there happens to be a sticky note right on the side of the monitor with the password to the computer, and if we open it up we are met with the now infamous OMG Hot Boss. If it wasn't clear already, Morgan gets bitches. And I'm sure that our secretary isn't the only person on Talos 1, with an eye for Transstar's youngest son. God, we're hot. Prey is a game all about freedom and creating your own story and gameplay. It's what makes it one of the best games ever. And because of that, there's a lot of cool and interesting little quirks in terms of what you can do in the story and how it changes dialogues and moments around you. And one of my personal favorite examples of this is breaking into Alex's office early. You see, near the end of the main story, you make your way to your older brother's offices in an attempt to talk to him and finally hear out everything he has to say about what is going on. But especially ingenuitive players may have actually found a way into the office beforehand. This can be done with parkour, the glue gun, hacking grav shifts, or just finding some undiscovered path to the office at the top of the arboretum. But if you do in fact break in, you are met with some hidden dialogue from Alex Yu, and even more interestingly, if you actually break his prized statue in his room, you hear this. That statue was worth a lot of money, Morgan. I'm going to be charitable and assume you scuffled with a typhon and didn't just break it out of spite. It's cool that the game can react to the player going off the beaten path. And whenever people ask me why Prey is one of my favorite games of all time, explaining situations like this is the perfect way to put it. If you are ever watching a playthrough of Prey and want to immediately get an idea of where someone's at in the game, look for how much coral there is everywhere. The more there is, the closer towards the end they are. For those that don't know, coral is a strange orange-like structure produced by the Weaver Typhons that based on all the research on Talos 1, seems to be a neural network of sorts from which they all communicate. It's actually this massive amount of coral that is the result of the summoning of the Apex Typhon at the end of the game, which we get to watch completely take over the station and send the Arboretum into zero G. But as to what exactly this coral substance is and how it works, we still aren't exactly sure. We do have this picture from a recent Prey art book collection though, which describes the entire process the Typhon used to take over other species, but even here we don't get any super in-depth explanations of coral itself. Rather, we just learn that the mimics kill and multiply, those mimics create new weavers, which create coral, phantoms, telepaths, and technopaths, all of which then defend the coral, after which the coral summons the apex to bring about chaos. We also know from events in game that the null wave device Alex Yu was working on was meant to stop this signal from the coral from ever reaching outside Typhon like the apex, but it seemingly fails to do so in the end, or it was used too late. The coral though, what seems to be the center of the Typhon nervous system, is never explained in depth, and it makes us begin to wonder how exactly this floating ball of energy leads to such powerful means of communication. Some in the community have even begun to speculate that coral is opening the actual space-time fabric of our universe to allow other beings to come through. Or it could even be a conduit for some sort of faster than light travel that can send things forward or back in time. Either way, it's just another mystery there's so much to learn about. One of the rarest achievements in Prey and Mooncrash alike is the Starbender Books Collection series. It tasks players with finding 12 separate novels in both Prey and Mooncrash that contain the stories of a man named Trevor Pulsar, who is on a journey to find a mysterious and powerful prism. The reason this set of books is so interesting though, is that they seem to be an analogy in many ways to the story of Prey itself, and maybe hiding some of the answers to the game's biggest secrets. The Dark Star Anomaly, one of the first books in the series, reads, Empress Tulmalane gazed past her stern reflection, into the inky black, her angular, features circum her angular features circumscribed by the prime viewing dome of the capital ship, Shatterthrax. The royal astronomer cleared his throat. 
Furthermore, Your Majesty, the Dark Star Anomaly will gain momentum once it begins devouring systems. Within a matter of months, the entire galaxy will be consumed. From that point, it will have enough mass to pull other galaxies into its maw. I suppose you want to fund an expedition to find this Starbender Prism. The way you prattle on about this thing, if it exists, it might be the key to saving our galaxy. Your Majesty, there's only one man I know mad enough to take this on. You can't mean Trevor Pulsar. And as the set of books goes on, we learn more and more about Trevor and his adventures fighting aliens and making friends. The more we read on, though, the more we start to wonder if some of these characters may actually be related to Praise, possibly with Trevor Pulsar being an analogy to Morgan Yu, the rebellious protagonist. But nonetheless, as the story goes on, we eventually reach a point in Book 6, Dark Star Rising, which says the following. The three sons of bel Kalar were melting into one another in the sky, twisted in their death throes as the Dark Star Anomaly devoured them with disconcerting alacrity. Trevor had managed to navigate the deadly debris whirling around the Anomaly and crash-landed Empress Tourmaline's royal raptor cruiser at the base of Mount Mool, a synthetic geopyramid which they were now surmounting. They stood panting beside a synth stone altar, its receptacle pulsing with crimson light. One minor detail I left out, Trevor, the Empress said between labored breaths. We put this into the altar and it devours the anomaly, taking us with it in the process, Trevor replied with a wink and his grim smile. You knew the whole time? Trevor wrapped his fingers around hers, both of them now holding the starbender prism. I was born for this, Trevor replied, and he pushed the prism into the altar. Could this be a clue that Morgan Yu and Alex Yu, who in this story may refer to the Empress, were actually always aware of the dangers they were working on, and that their plan may in fact be to devour not only the Typhon, but humanity with them in the process, using an altar, or in our case, the research into human-Typhon hybrids. Maybe Morgan and Alex from the very beginning plotted the downfall of humanity in order to begin a new age because they saw it as our only salvation from extinction, and we only forgot about it when we play as Morgan in-game because of the extensive Neuromod testing. Regardless, I will have a lot more to say on this topic later on this list, and I highly encourage any of you interested in Prey to read the full set of Starbender novels, as they could be a full video even in and of themselves. Located in the guts or gravity utility transportation system of Prey, one of my personal favorite places in the whole game, is a cool little easter egg a lot of people may have missed. Under one of the fan ducts is a set of containers that have red blinking lights, but if you actually look at the engravings on these structures, you can see Corvo Canister Company, established 1798. This is an obvious reference to Corvo, who is the main character from Dishonored 1 and a playable character in the sequel, Arcane Studios' other big game series. So it looks like both likely take place in the same universe, which could totally work considering how far apart both are. But this would also mean that Deathloop takes place in the Prey universe as well, since it has been confirmed by Arcane recently that both Deathloop and Arcane are in the same universe. Could the tragedies of Dunwall or the experiments of Time Loops in Black Reef have anything to do with the tech and lore we see in Prey that happens decades and centuries later? Only time and more sequels will tell. Probably one of the most riveting choices in all of Prey is deciding the fate of Aaron Ingram. He's a captive aboard Talos One who is a convicted criminal in a Russian gulag on death row, who was taken from his captivity to instead be held aboard the space station as one of many volunteers who are used in heinous experiments. When we find Aaron, we can read his rap sheet to see that he has been convicted of human trafficking, kidnapping, solicitation of a minor, amongst other many offenses. And it's here we get to decide whether to let Aaron go from his containment cell, or if we should instead release a mimic into the cage and allow it to tear Aaron's body apart and turn him into an alien host. The decision can have drastic consequences on the ending of the game and is an analogy to the Myers-Briggs tests at the beginning, but regardless of what you pick, this event with Aaron gives us a good insight into the research that was happening aboard Talos 1. You see, Transtar would take convicted felons and volunteers of people in jail on Earth and place them into holding facilities on board the station, after which they would be fed to Typhon organisms in order to allow them to multiply and create more versions of themselves which could then be harvested in a recycler in order to help with the creation of neuromods. And this means that all of those neuromods we are using in game that were created before, over 8,000 as we hear in some dialogue lines from Alex Yu, are created off the backs of tortured and sacrificed humans. A haunting revelation, for sure.
One of the most horrifying stories in the entirety of Prey has to be that of Luka Golukin. You see, Luka was originally one of the hundreds of Russian convicts in the Talos One Volunteer Program, where heinous criminals and sometimes innocents with forged convictions volunteered themselves to become guinea pigs for top secret research conducted via the mega corporation Transtar. But in Luca's case, he was an especially violent and evil individual. On Earth, he would jerry-rig entire explosive devices and commit terrorist acts. And when first moved aboard Talos One, it was said that he immediately bit the finger of one of the researchers off and swallowed it whole. In fact, in one early experiment, a telepath Typhon implant was put into his brain and showed massive aversion to his mind considering it pure evil, meaning one of the most wicked alien forces in the entire galaxy couldn't even stand him. But as if it couldn't get any worse during his time on Talos One, Luca was given extensive neuromod testing and experimentation that over time, just like Morgan, began to cause significant personality drift. At one point, a neuromod of the award-winning chef on board Talos One named William Mitchell was given to Luca, and after the operation, Luca awoke not only with impressive culinary skills, but also a deep, deep hatred for the real chef. It's because of this that during the Typhon outbreak on the space station, that Luca's first order of business was heading to the cafeteria and slaughtering William Mitchell in cold blood, after which he took his name tag and uniform and assumed the role of the now-murdered man. And that leads us to meeting with him in game, where we can find him in the cafeteria where he claims he is in fact William Mitchell, and that he needs us to find a water valve regulator in order to fix his kitchen. If we do help him out though, he tells us to go grab something in the freezer, after which he swiftly locks the door and tries to kill us. And after we awake barely alive, he calls and taunts us throughout the rest of the game, leading to one of the most memorable side quests in the entire story. Where this tale starts to get absolutely crazy though, is how many insane stories and theories revolve around this man Luca. First of all, in that freezer that we get locked in, many players searched around and noticed lots of weird looking and unidentified meat all over the counters that certainly didn't look like eels, which is the main source of food on Talos One, another interesting thing we'll dive into later. And this weird discovery only becomes more horrifying if we actually go to a computer terminal on the station and try to locate William Mitchell's real tracking bracelet. Because if we do, it leads us right into one of these pieces of suspicious and mysterious meat in the freezer, strongly implying that Luca has been killing people aboard Talos One and storing their remains in the freezer to eat at a later date. A cannibal amongst our mitts. But Luca being a cannibal might be the least of our worries, because during his extensive side quests throughout the game, we learn a lot more about him. First of all, he is in fact a very violent man, and sets up recycler charger booby traps all over the station in order to try and kill us and stop us from finding him. However, even more interestingly, we also get a lot of peculiar dialogue and speeches from him, like this one. If we are still here when it arrives, it screams so loud. We hear it in our head. It is still far away, but it is coming closer. It will eat your prison, every person on board, and it will still be hungry. This scene strongly implies that Will, or really Luca, is somehow communicating with Typhon and seems to have some sort of connection with them and a sense of a looming threat, which for anyone who has played the final act of Prey knows is coming very shortly in the form of the Apex Typhon. Another super unknown example of this is if you actually first meet Luca in the cafeteria already having the water valve regulator, he will remark about how Morgan's mind seems to quote unquote transcend the future, already knowing that he would need the item for a fix. So it seems clear then that Luca, through all of his torture and neuromod testing, has had his mind connect with the Typhon themselves, hearing their call through the coral, which gives him a greater sense of the impending doom. And after all, this would make a lot of sense, considering in game, if we take enough Typhon based neuromods on our playthrough as upgrades, we will start to hear the Typhon on the station speak to us and warn us about impending doom too. By far the most haunting of these Luca revelations though only comes if we allow Luca to survive until the very ending sequences of the game, where if he is alive, he will call us and provide us with this haunting monologue that most players never see. You feel it, am you? Screaming is louder now. Getting close. I think screams are coming from the future. And you. Screams of people on Earth. Screams an animal. Makes one caught in a hunter's jaw. 
So this proves that Luca does in fact see the future. But if that's the case, could it imply that the Typhon themselves have a special relation to space and time that we don't fully understand yet? And only by completely changing your mind and becoming one with the Typhon yourself can a human understand this. Maybe that's exactly why Alex Yu was doing all the research in the first place. Maybe that's why a human-phantom hybrid is so important for the future of humanity. But that's a theory I'll save for later on this list. Because the more interesting theories for now still revolve around our man, Luca. First of all, is Luca really the bad man we've been led to believe? After all, with all this neuromod testing and personality drift, it's hard to say whether or not Luca was actually bad, or if it was just what the scientists on Talos once said, in order to clear their conscience that they had created a human born of pure evil. Maybe those original stories are actually just the scientists coping with the fact that they've made a monster. Next up, is Luca actually another example of the meta-narrative and prey? For those of you who don't know, if you do the escape shuttle ending, the version of the looking glass simulation that comes up in the cutscene is actually a much lower version than the true ending, implying that the simulation we are going through is just one of many tests that Alex is putting Typhon through with Morgan Neuromods, as we learn at the end of the base game. Maybe this Luca we meet in game is nothing more than a fabrication put into the simulation by Alex that is meant to test us and our new humanity as an alien. But potentially the more interesting theory is that Luca Luca is actually a manifestation of our Typhon mind in the simulation itself. What if the things we hear Luca say aren't actually him at all, but instead our real mind in the real world considering we are an alien in a simulation of a human mind? When we hear Luca talk about this future Armageddon and the evil deeds he has done, maybe it's actually our Typhon mind trying to break through the simulation and alert us to something strange going on. This could even imply that the reason the cook runs away and tries to stop us is that he's afraid of us because he sees us as an alien. And a quest that's about chasing a man down who tried to kill you is actually truly a quest about a man running for his life from a bloodthirsty monster that eventually chases him down to an escape pod and murders him. And even more crazy, this idea that Luca may in fact not be such a bad man, and that it's all in our head for whatever reason, may actually be answered in one of the cut transcribes from the game, which some in the community were able to data mine in the hidden game files, and would have been the final transcribe you find on Luca's dead body in this escape pod. This is for MU so you don't forget. Transstar asks for volunteers for experiments in space. Promises to let us go from prison if we come to this one. A life sentence, over in a day. Like all Transstar deals, it's false. They take us up in shuttle, like cattle. Take us to your prison, feed us, run tests. But something is wrong, I think. They put us back on shuttle, say the tests are over, we are free. They drug us, herd us like cattle. And then they bring us back here. You bring us back here, and kill us one by one. Feed us to your beasts while you watch and take notes. I see it. There, M.U., on your uniform. You watch as you open my cage. Let me see the beasts you keep here. It is not evil, I think. It is an animal. It is hungry. But the hunger, it is everywhere. It is hungry for thought. It enters my brain, leaves hunger there, like an egg. It grows, cracks. It's hunger inside of me. It's almost all I can think about. But it does not eat me. Maybe it does not like how I think, or sees my brain is wrong. Or maybe you decide to stop when I scream. I go back to my cell, and doctors come with needles and tests and questions. I bite their fingers, swallow them whole, and they beat me, take me to security. Alarms. Guards try and move me, and I kill them. But their uniforms do not fit. I am still hungry. Go find crew to blend in. Find the kitchen. Find an idiot man who lets me in. And I look at him. His suit size fits me. I kill him, and now I am him. I do this again and again. Help people come to the kitchen, see what they have, kill them. They are just Transstar. It's just yet another amazing example of how well constructed the narrative and meta-narrative of Prey is, and just how many connections you can start to make when looking deeper into the story. I can't stress enough how underrated everything about this game is, and how much more love it truly deserves. One of the worst feelings you can get in Prey is accidentally stumbling upon the escape pod room, thinking you found a way out, only to discover that none of the pods actually work. In fact, the only one that works in-game that you can in fact escape from is none other than Alex Yu's personal escape route located in the Arboretum. But what at first glance just seems like a problem born of the alien Typhon outbreak may actually be much more sinister. 
You see, in an email exchange in game sent from Frank Jones, a shuttle bay engineer, to Emmanuel Mendez, he accidentally sends confidential information to Emmanuel when he meant to send it to his lover, Emanuela. Emanuela, I'm not supposed to tell anyone this, but I wanted you to know since you're someone I really care about. The escape pods don't work. If there's ever an emergency on the station, don't try to use them. However, I'm working on rigging one of them to work. Don't tell anyone. This email thread proves that the escape pods on the station were never actually meant to work. But now the question becomes, why? Well, we may get our answer during the ending of the game when a man named Walter Dahl is sent to the station with an army of military class operators in order to shut everything down and get information on Project Cobalt out. In game, there are many options on how to handle this, including tricking Dahl into helping you by removing his neuromods, killing him outright, or many more. But the question still looms of why Dahl was sent to kill everyone in the first place. Could it be that the heads of the Transar organization never intended for anyone aboard Talos 1 to actually ever come home in one piece? Maybe the escape pods never worked because they were never supposed to, and all humans that were sent to the space station were secretly being sent on a one-way journey, from which they would never return, no matter the outcome. A harrowing revelation, for sure. While in theory Prey is a horror game of sorts, there aren't actually that many traditionally scary things in the game. Sure, the mimics and other monsters are terrifying at first, but that feeling wears off quickly once you learn how to deal with them. Most places are well lit, you have a lot of ways to fight the monsters, and there's almost no jump scares as long as you take the time to check every room. And by the way, I actually really like that. It adds suspense without being ridiculous like other games in the horror genre. The gameplay speaks for itself without relying too much on the scare factor. However, there is one moment in the game that most players on their first playthrough at least have never seen, that for me was by far the scariest thing in the entire story. If you head down into the director's office in Psychotronics, which is unlocked by revealing a secret door behind a wall and requires a specific keycard, you are met with a strange room that seems to have been for lounging. It's simply a square area surrounded by a looking glass screen with furniture in the middle, and on the screen opposite the entry, there's a small touch to calibrate button. It's a button that hasn't shown up on any of the other screens in game, so it catches your eye immediately. Sadly though, for players that can't help themselves touching this button over and over again as it moves across the screen, this eventually results in one of the worst jump scares of all time, followed by an attack from a phantom. All right, let's calibrate this screen, chat. You know? Bro, dude, I, dude, I knew that was coming and I still had a heart attack. <laughs> For those of you who are unlucky enough to have stumbled upon this without knowing what was about to happen, I truly am sorry for the therapy you must be going through now. Mimics are not only the coolest and most interesting enemy in all of Prey, but also just one of the most fascinating in games in general. And the reason for this is their signature ability to transform into any object in the environment they see and hide in plain sight, only to pounce on the player once they get too close. But one big question revolving around these little guys is how do they even do this? And even more haunting, are they able to turn into more advanced things like, say, humans? First of all, on the topic of how mimics even transform, we can actually find a scientific research article in-game that states the following. Time to place your bets on how this actually works. My money is on number two, obviously. Number one, hallucinogenic field. Mimics project a field that causes observers to think they see the object. Number two, pocket dimension. Mimics swap places with the object in a parallel universe, stays connected via wormhole. Number three, transmutation. Mimic reconfigures its atoms and molecules while maintaining its own subjective consciousness. As for why the scientists on Talos 1 thought the pocket dimension theory was most likely, it comes down to other research logs and entries we can find later in game that explains how during testing on mimics, scientists found that objects and the mimics that turned into them themselves did not share any biological or cellular similarities, meaning the mimics were not just rearranging their molecular structure to appear like another thing. On top of this, when taking space-time signatures of the objects Mimics turned into, the readings for the time movement and dilation did not match other objects that were real just beside them, implying that the things the Mimics were turning into actually came from a separate pocket dimension on a different space-time continuum. In fact, some in the Prey community have even begun to speculate that the real reason the original aliens were able to travel through space so long to reach Earth's orbit was because they teleported into different pocket dimensions to slow down the progression of time and not die. 
Regardless though, as to how mimics actually change the environment around them is still a complete mystery, and they may be hiding even more secrets too. Because hidden in the datamine game files and released to some press agencies, there was at one point a very gruesome and horrific animation in-game that showed a mimic transforming into… human beings? And while this was never implemented in-game, it seems to imply that at one point in development this was an idea that was supposed to be added to the game, and if mimics do actually have the ability to copy not just inanimate objects, but humans too, could this mean that some of the people we talk to in-game were nothing more than aliens taking the form of a harmless human? This idea ties very well into the ending of the game and alien-human hybrids as well, and adds just an extra layer of intrigue to a story already criminally underanalyzed. If it isn't already clear enough, Arcane Studios loves to put hidden messages and meanings in even mundane and unassuming places, and specifically in Prey, this happens a lot in the passwords and codes. One of the coolest examples of this is the password to Alex Yu's computer in his office, which is Chenguashen. I probably butchered that. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, Chenguashen is the name of a Chinese deity that was said to be the god of the moat and walls, or god of the boundary. This god was said to protect Chinese citizens in specific cities, villages, or towns from the dimensions of the afterlife that could wreak havoc, and served as a sort of god protecting the boundaries between dimensions and all those that serve them. This is a very specific analogy to use on Alex's password in game, and may actually give us some clues to his character. Could this in fact be a hint that Alex is some sort of godlike figure, who has figured out how to bridge the gap between the Typhon's dimension and ours? Remember that poster in Morgan's room that seemed to give us a hint about the Typhon and where they came from? Well, in that poster, it looks a lot like they are bridging the gap between dimensions and breaking into ours, or at least that's one way to interpret it. And if that is the correct interpretation, then maybe Alex somehow played a role in bringing the Typhon to Earth. But how could that be the case if the Typhon are the ones that originally came to us? Well, maybe Alex is simply the final key they needed in order to bring on the advent of the Coral and Apex Typhon. And either way, it seems clear that Alex has some hidden intentions we still aren't fully clear on. To me at least, this password is a further hint that Alex is pulling a lot of the strings behind the entire story of Prey, more than most people in the community think, and he probably has a master plan to bridge the gap between dimensions and human-alien hybrids alike that people seldom talk about in-game instead only being left to small hints. When walking around the Talos 1 space station in Prey or Pythias moon base in Mooncrash, you may have come across these weird machines often found in offices called Reployers. They sort of look like a printer you would find in a regular office, but there's no real indication that they actually do anything of the sort. Modeled after the 1965 IBM 2540 card punch and read machines, the Reployer simply sits in offices in-game and does nothing. And don't take my word for it. Even characters in game have no idea what they are used for. In fact, here's just one example of that from a note we can find from Sarah Elazar, Chief of Security. Remember, it's the Eradicator Fabrication Plan we want, not the Reployer Plan. No one knows what the hell a Reployer is. So it's clear then that these strange devices aren't even understood by the people that have them. But then what exactly is their purpose in the first place? Well, some in the community think they may actually be some sort of secret monitoring device put in offices to watch employees, while others speculate it could be some weird social experiment to see what people do with an unknown object. After all, corruption and weird experiments are commonplace aboard Talos 1. The real answer though may lie in our real world, where in an interview Ricardo Baer, a senior game designer at Arcane Studios, had some interesting things to say about reployers in game. He explained that Reployers originally started as a joke, when one of the artists had made an asset in game that no one could figure out what it was, so they asked them to remove it. But somehow it seemed like the Reployer kept ending up in the game every day, even after multiple people were being told to remove it from the game entirely. And over time this strange phenomenon became an inside joke at the studio, until it was decided the Reployer could in fact stay in game, something it likely would have done regardless. So what that really means though, is that literally no one, not us, not the characters, and not even the developers themselves know what this thing is. One of the lesser known side quests in Prey called Drunk Tank tells the story of a man caught down on his luck. If you find a specific transcribe from Emily Carter in the Escape Pod Bay, she explains how she is worried about a co-worker who didn't show up for work, who just so happens to have a severe problem with alcohol. 
If you go and track this coworker's tracking bracelet on the Talos One personal computers, you are led to the water treatment facility, where lo and behold, you can in fact find the person trapped within a giant cage of eels. Drunkenly falling into a hazardous vat filled to the brim with hungry eels is for sure a gruesome death, but to me the more interesting part of this quest is all the implications around it. First of all, eels are something we see all over Talos 1, but we never get a complete answer as to why. We know they are used for sewage treatment as they love to eat waste, and we also know that most of these eels are converted into food aboard Talos 1, as we learn from our endeavors in the kitchen. But could the eels actually be holding more secrets too? One idea is that they simply are something else that ties prey to Dishonored, because in Dishonored, as many of you know, there are many eel connections. But there's also some small references in games to eels having psychedelic-like properties, and this could give us a clue as to what they're actually being used for aboard Talos 1. The main theory is that they're actually used for enhancing the power of neuromods on the station. And, as it's often said in many ancient religious cultures, eels have psionic powers that enhance our understanding of the universe. So maybe these little slimy guys are more than just water treatment and food. The realization at the end of Prey that everything was just a simulation is hard to grasp for sure, and the follow-up revelation that the Earth has already been invaded and overrun by Typhon only makes the situation worse. But ever since this ending, many in the Prey community have wondered about how Typhon even got to Earth in the first place. We know about many small stories in the base game of people trying to escape from the station, or Typhon potentially escaping containment undetected, but there was never any 100% conclusive proof on how it could have happened. That was until Mooncrash dropped, and considering that almost no one in the world has actually played this DLC, let alone even people that have played the base game of Prey itself, the ending is a huge revelation that many people don't know about. Because you see, at the end of Prey Mooncrash, it's revealed that Casmacorp, the people keeping you captive while you run through the simulation, are going to let you die. But your character manages to save themselves and crash land on the moon, where they were able to then escape presumably due to all of the knowledge they gained on their runs through the Pythias moon base in simulation. What some players may have missed though, is that in the final seconds of the ending cutscene for Prey Mooncrash, we get to see the space shuttle landing safely on Earth, next to what looks like a beach but on the dashboard are two identical dolls. This doll was one that the player character kept as a reminder of their daughter throughout the game, but in our entire time playing, we only ever see one doll, not two. This scene heavily implies that this event is how the Typhon originally got to Earth, and considering Mooncrash likely takes place before the end of the base game, this would mean regardless of what Morgan did on the station, Typhon would have invaded and doomed Earth. In fact, maybe Alex already knew about this during the time that the base game takes place, as reports of things happening on Earth were already apparently going on. Now that I have made over 10 hours worth of content on video game theories and lore, I know that some of the best and least well known things seem to always come from little one-off books or texts that no one actually reads in the game. And Prey is no different, because the three-part evacuation series of books tells a panic-inducing story about secret advanced testing taking place on Earth. Day 1. Some jets flew over, very low, and the sound was so loud it made me jump. I don't know where they were from, but they were bristling with bombs and rockets. Everyone was looking up and the sounds of the jets was echoing off the buildings, but we could not see them anymore. The sky was clear and I could see some pink smoke rising from the direction of the stadium. Then the sirens started. I had not heard them since my childhood. Some people stood confused, but my instinct told me to run. Run away from the stadium. Run away from Alzia. Some people were running with me, but they didn't know where to go. I saw a policeman directing people into a basement restaurant. I think it was an old bomb shelter. I looked up at the sky again and saw an airliner. It was not military, I am certain. I think it was going to the airport. While I watched, it turned into glitter and without a sound, it was gone. A man near me began to curse. I fell down and hit my head on the street. Day 2. I woke up, still in the street. An M35 truck was stopped near me and the driver was yelling at me to get in. There were several people in the back already four or five soldiers and about a dozen civilians, including children. I got in the truck and someone gave me a bottle of water. I asked what was happening and the soldier just shrugged. The pink smoke was now mixed with gray and swirled into the sky. There was so much of it, it seemed to cover the entire city. We kept picking people up and the truck was full. Before we got to the highway, we heard shooting. The soldiers climbed down and readied their weapons. The commander told me to drive the truck as far as possible to the west. Then they ran towards the shooting. Day three. We had driven far enough that our fuel ran out. More jets flew over, headed towards the city. 
One circled back and made several passes over us but did not shoot. That night in the desert, we sat by the empty truck and listened to the booming of artillery. Flashes of bombs and lightning covered the horizon. In the morning, our city was lost in what appeared to be a shimmering heat wave. High overhead, there were brilliant flashes of lights. Some said it was an atomic bomb, and others said it was God's wrath. Today, I know it was just an accident. Scientists that thought they knew everything, but they did not. This strange recounting of events is something not touched on at all during the main quests in Prey, and it seems to tell the story of government testing that went extremely wrong. Most theories online speculate that this evacuation was actually the result of some early failed recycler technology accidentally being set off. This line in particular stands out. I looked up at the sky again and saw an airliner. It was not military, I am certain. I think it was going to the airport. While I watched, it turned in a glitter without a sound. It was just gone. That glitter that this person saw was likely actually the output from a recycler charge going off. As we know in game, throwing a recycler grenade at anything causes it to explode into different colored balls of material, something that could easily be mistaken for glitter. But then there comes the question of what is all of these giant white flashes and pink smoke extending into the sky? To me, that pink smoke almost sounds like the residue of a Typhon-based ability going off, and those white flashes could in fact be either recycler charges or nuclear bombs going off. To me, what is most interesting about all of it though, is that it implies there was some alien testing going on on Earth as well, not just aboard Talos 1, which would make sense considering in-game multiple high-power governments had their hands on this technology for decades before. Could it be that the United States government almost unleashed the Typhon onto humanity much earlier than Transtar? Maybe all of those flashes, smoke, and weird glitter was the result of the United States actually setting off massive recycler grenade explosions all over in order to stop a Typhon threat that had just escaped, or just an accidental mishap entirely. Either way, the reach of the research going on at Talos 1 extends far beyond the walls of just the space station itself. As we already discussed earlier on this list, the mimics and how they function was one of the biggest points of research on all of Talos 1, with the main theory being that they create portals to different dimensions and swap places with objects that they disguise themselves as in our real world. But one very rare transcript in game might just reveal some very peculiar versions of these other dimensions. Titled A Universe of Shoes, it's a short entry from two women on the Pythias moon base we can find in Moon Crash. What's the emergency? This mimic you brought me. Something is definitely wrong with it. It keeps throwing various shoes at me? Are they nice shoes? I'm serious. It's like punching holes to somewhere. A universe of shoes, I don't know. But my point is, someone with sufficient Typhon abilities and a strong attachment to someplace else, like, like a place like Earth? Yes, exactly. I think you could open a door, maybe even walk through it. It would be more like getting sucked through a very tiny, tiny straw. I think I could tweak the containment shield to stabilize the mimic. We'd need Riley's permission to run this. Well, what are you waiting for? I'll be in the lab. The idea of a mimic creating quantum tunneling through the universe into an entire realm of nothing but sentient shoes is obviously hilarious, but it also makes us wonder what other kinds of universes are out there in the Prey lore. Because in this entry, it's implied that mimics can transform into things they haven't yet seen before, in theory, from other dimensions. And if this is true, could this power potentially be harnessed in order to travel to new and interesting space-time dimensions themselves? For me at least, this gets my mind racing on a potential Prey sequel, where at some point in the game, we could gain the ability to travel to new and super varied locations and new dimensions that would provide a huge variety in environmental design and allow us to use our powers in more interesting ways. And more than anything, it's just another example of how cool and deep the lore of Prey goes when you dig more into it. Even if the lore here is probably just a joke, it has a lot of potential. One of the coolest parts about Prey is just how connected the world and its history are. For example, almost every single employee on Talos 1 had a tracking bracelet, and in-game, even for the characters that aren't involved at all in the main story, you can track them down and find valuable loot or just some more deep dives into the lore. One specific employee, though, left strangely out of this gameplay loop is the employee Marco Simmons. He's one of the scientists we see right at the start of the game during our testing, before the outbreak, specifically the one that leaves to grab Dr. Bellamy a coffee before a mimic sneaks in and starts killing everyone. So naturally, some players in the community started searching for Dr. Simmons to get some more background on him, but his body and tracking bracelet are nowhere to be seen anywhere on the station. 
In fact, Marco Simmons doesn't even come up in the company roster charts. But surely he was part of the science research team, right? After all, top researchers like Dr. Bellamy refer to him by name and seem to have a story passed with him. So what exactly is going on? Well, it might go a lot deeper than most people think. We know from some other side quests in game that not every employee on Talos 1 was happy. For instance, in the side quest Disgruntled Employee, we learn about a man named Grant Lockwood who was terminated by HR but never showed up on any shuttle records leaving the station. We find a transcript from Sarah Elzar asking for someone to track Grant's bracelet from deep storage, and lo and behold, if we do, we can find his body floating in space just outside the station with a briefcase full of his belongings, which includes a high-tech neuromod. It's clear that Grant was trying to escape the station and failed dying in orbit. But the fact that he has top secret research in his traveling bag implies that he may have been up to something, along with the title of the quest itself. This is further backed up by some logs we can find in Prey Moon Crash that confirm some Chasmal Corporation spies had infiltrated not only the Transstar Pythias moon base, but also Talos 1 as well. Claire Witten being just one example of these types of operatives. So maybe Grant Lockwood was actually one of these operatives. After all, from certain angles in game, it could be argued that his trajectory leaving the station would have eventually taken him to the moon. And even more interestingly, this idea of spies on the station would also be a perfect explanation for Marco Simmons. What if both Simmons and Grant were actually colluding with inside Talos 1? That would explain how both seem to evade detection on the space station for so long, and also the weird events surrounding both. Because remember, Remember, in Simmons' case, the last time we ever see him is leaving a room just mere moments before a mimic appears out of nowhere and starts what is presumed to be the start of the outbreak. Why wasn't Simmons attacked by this same mimic? And if he was right near the testing rooms right when everything started going downhill, how could he have possibly survived with no trace of his body anywhere else? And even more interestingly, we learn from January that Marco worked in the Neuromod division and was responsible for installing Neuromods on subjects in the simulation testing like Morgan. January says he switched the neuromods that Simmons was supposed to install into a blank one in order for us to remember the day before when we do eventually break out. But the whole conversation is very short and almost cagey, as if January could be hiding something and could that something be that Marco Simmons was in on all of this? Maybe as part of a plan to help January break Morgan out and cause a Typhon containment breach. Could it be that Marco Simmons and Grant Lockwood actually were both high-level Chasma spies that maybe even played a role in the events of the game itself? In fact, in the now many Reddit AMAs of employees that are still working at or have worked at Arcane Studios, multiple questions have been asked about this mystery, and every single time, the employees respond that some people's mysteries and fates will be forever unsolved, which implies that Arcane did in fact know something was going on with Simmons and Lockwood, and my guess as they were both spies that helped orchestrate the downfall of Talos 1. You may have noticed during your time on Talos 1 that everyone you come across is an adult. There aren't any children. And that's because children were never allowed on the space station, which naturally makes sense considering its real purpose is for hyper-advanced and top-secret testing on alien organisms. However, that doesn't mean we don't see anything relating to kids in the games at all, like the doll from Moon Crash, or even more interestingly, this note in the base game. Hi, Mommy. I've been having bad dreams since you left. Dr. Preston said I should draw it, and that would help make them go away. I hope you like my picture and come home soon. I love you. Corey. Next to this note, we can find this picture, which seems to clearly be a drawing of a phantom, like we see in-game. But how could this be? After all, the note from this child would have come from Earth, not Talos 1. Yet lo and behold, here it is. We know that telepaths and game have the ability to read people's minds and alter how we perceive the world, but the issue with this is we still have the physical evidence of the mother having the note. Potentially she was mind controlled to write it herself, potentially she was mind controlled to write it herself, but we can't find any other instances of anything like this in game to corroborate this theory. Could it then be that this child actually saw the Typhon on Earth? Maybe the Typhon had already gotten to Earth long before the escapes at Talos 1 and at the Pythias moon base. Another explanation too would be that the telepath on board Talos 1 somehow saw the connection between the mother and son and tapped into the son's mind on Earth in order to make the drawing. But in my opinion, that would make no sense because I just don't see the motive for a telepath to actually do this. What benefit does that provide the Typhon race of aliens? But that would mean that the most likely explanation here is that the child did in fact see some sort of alien monster like this, meaning Typhon would in fact already have been on Earth. 
Think about all of those scary stories of monsters hiding in the dark and mysterious sounds we hear about every new millennia on Earth. What if all of these ghost stories and paranormal run-ins were actually just humanity making first contact with a hostile alien force that would later be studied on Talos 1 far into the future. Honestly, this theory does seem pretty far-fetched, so the real explanation is probably it's a telepath doing something. But either way, something is weird going on here with this drawing, and if it really is a child on Earth, then this story goes much deeper than we originally thought. Depending on who you are, the ending of Prey is either your favorite part of the whole story or a cheap way to conclude what was otherwise an amazing game. But I think it's all the deeper implications of this finale and what a lot of people didn't pick up on that make it so great. You see, in the ending of Prey, we find out that the entire story we just played was nothing but a simulation, and that at some point in the future, Alex Yu has been injecting Morgan Yu's mirror neurons into Typhon organisms in order to make them feel empathy for humanity, presumably in an attempt to save Earth, now overrun with aliens. What this really means, though, is that Project Cobalt was in fact initiated. And for those of you that don't know, this was a top secret project devised between Alex, Morgan, and other scientists that would potentially test if instead of injecting Typhon neuromods into humans, we could do it the other way around. Here's the Project Cobalt transcribe we can find in game. In light of what we now know the Typhon are capable of and not capable of, it seems prudent to revest in the Project Cobalt material. Igwe? Neuromods can already adapt Typhon material to the human mind. There's no reason in principle the reverse wouldn't work. Say you managed to insert human neurons into a Typhon. How would you know it's successful? The new neuron structures would need to mature over a series of actual experiences. Or simulated ones. What? Simulate the experiences. Calvino, he has. Right? Okay, look, it's fascinating, but let's focus on what we know is working. I don't want anyone devoting resources to this. But from everything we can see in our time playing the game, we never actually see any evidence of this project happening. Only vague clues to it potentially being looked into, with our best evidence being a small note on a whiteboard in Alex Yu's bunker that reads, Backup Project Cobalt, in reference to the Null Wave Weapon Project itself. This implies that Project Cobalt was a contingency plan of sorts if the Null Wave device to stop the Typhon did not in fact work. And judging by the end of Prey, it seems that very well may be exactly what happened. After all, think about it. If the Null Wave device does work, wouldn't the humans on Earth be able to just use it after the Typhon made landfall to try and help on Earth as well? So that's what the most likely case is then. Humanity and Alex or Morgan tried to use the Null Wave device in the real timeline, and it didn't work which resulted in Earth falling and Alex Yu reopening Project Cobalt in order to try and make a human-alien hybrid that could speak to the aliens and broker a peace. And that is what all the simulations are for, for peace. Except, I think it might be a lot crazier than that. You see, in Mooncrash, there's a character story we do while playing as Riley Yu, where we learn that Alex Yu instructed her to upload her consciousness into an operator in case she were to perish on the moon base that was now being thrown into disarray. And right after uploading her consciousness, she immediately is killed due to a bug put into the operator from a Chasma Corporation spy. There is no direct indication that Alex Yu intended for this to happen at all, but looking at the end of Prey again, I start to wonder. Because it's at the end of Prey that the only human we see is Alex himself, with all the other voices we hear simply being characters from the main game who put their consciousness into operators just like Riley Yu. And that's where the horrifying realization sets in. Could it be that Alex Yu planned for all this to happen from the beginning? We know from recordings of early conversations between Morgan and Alex that they were originally both hell-bent on doing deep research into the Typhon and progressing humanity forward, no matter the cost. And this is confirmed when we learn of all the horrible things Alex would do, even to his little brother, in order to achieve that goal. So my theory is that Alex at some point while researching the Typhon could have decided that the only way for humanity to progress forward was to sacrifice himself. Alex knew that the Typhon were too strong and would eventually overrun Earth. So instead, in secret behind everyone, he started to hatch a plan to figure out how to join the side of the alien invaders, risking all of humanity in the process. That's why everyone is an operator at the end of the game. They all met the same fate as Riley Yu in Mooncrash, with Alex asking them to back up their consciousness while knowing behind the scenes he would move the pawns of other forces to have them murdered right after. 
And it was at this point Alex would be able to use the collective brain power of all of his scientists to create a new kind of human being while Earth falls. While this is a crazy theory, if it does have any truth to it, that would mean that the Eldritch Horror-like ending where we decide to trick Alex into thinking we are good only to slaughter him is actually the one ending that makes the most sense. An alien who joins with the personality of Morgan and his past to figure out the biggest enemy we face throughout the game was Alex Yu himself, a man with a password on his computer that corresponds to the Chinese deity who was the gatekeeper for citizens from the beings of other dimensions, a god that instructs the fall of humanity, a man who creates false memories, sacrifices all friends and family, and in the process potentially transcends the entire human race into a new reality. I'm not high, I swear. As we already know, the entire story of Prey, spoiler alert, turned out to be nothing more than a simulation, but calling it only a simulation does a lot of disservice to the actual events that took place, and also doesn't account for the fact that as far as we are aware, most of what happens in game is memories from Morgan's real life. So it isn't exactly all just made up it would seem, there is in fact a method to the madness. But what if the simulation went even further? After all, if anything, the final scene of the game where we find out we are an alien and can fight or play nice is the moment that seems most like a simulation out of everything. So what if the entire story and world of Prey, all of the main plot and the finale where we learn everything was fake, was fake? Wouldn't it make sense to create simulations within simulations to simulate whether a Typhon would react in a good or bad manner towards Alex Yu in the first place? And who is to say Alex, Morgan, or even the Typhon themselves are actually real? Maybe the only thing real about all of this is the looking glass technology, which is what can make anything, no matter how fake it seems, real. Maybe the entire game of Prey and Mooncrash alike are nothing but top secret government programs to train people on what to do if we ever actually see an alien invasion. I'm running out of ideas, okay? <laughs> Beyond the crazy and interesting theories about killer aliens, evil personas, and hitting meaning throughout all of Talos 1, the real biggest theory about Prey is just why this game never got the love it deserved. You see, when it first released, the game came out to reviews including a 4 out of 10 from IGN and a 6 out of 10 from GameSpot. And while I understand it, considering the game did have some bugs on release, and for some could become unplayable, it actually in many ways reminds me of Cyberpunk 2077 but without ever getting the redemption story and love it always deserved. It's tragic just how unappreciated this game really is, and I mean it when I say Prey is quite literally the greatest immersive sim ever made, and one of the best games ever made full stop. And that's not even to mention it also has the greatest DLC ever made that only an extremely small handful of people even gave a shot, even amongst the Prey player base. Sometimes in life, things just don't work out. No matter how much love you pour into a project, no matter how great that end result is, sometimes, for whatever reason, it just doesn't do well. And while there are a lot of things we can look at and guess as to why Prey didn't reach the audience it should have, whether it be the bugs on release, a game that was too complex and hard to get into, or a lack of marketing that resonated, none of that matters. Because in my mind, this game was criminally robbed from the success it should have had. It's the exact type of game I always see people online wishing would come out, but instead of actually playing it, everyone just complains that games aren't the same anymore. But the truth is that so many games just like Prey are amazing, people just aren't giving them a shot. Take a look at this clip from Rafael Colantonio in an interview with Noclip talking about how he founded Arcane and how he led on the creation of Prey and how those initial reviews and sentiment affected him. It's, 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 this is a very hard world, it's a rough world, where people spend three, four years on something, pour all their passion, they make it, frankly, I mean, we see the result, Prey's a great game, except that when it ships, you might have some bugs, and, uh, and that's it. All it takes is one angry journalist, uh, sorry, not pointing fingers, of course, and, uh, and they give you a 4 out of 10. After having said, oh, I enjoyed this game so much for 30, 30 hours. And then there was this crash that could not, could not allow me to keep playing. 4 out of 10. That, you know, that hurts. You can see the pain in his eyes and feel the sadness in his voice. Because deep down, he knows this game is so much better than the credit it got. And so underappreciated for what it should be. 
But that's why this game, more than any I can think of, deserves a sequel. Something that now under the Xbox banner could release day one on Game Pass and reach an audience the first could only dream of. Because I truly believe that if more people gave this game a shot, a real one, it would be not only amongst the pantheon of the greatest games of all time, but damn near the very top of it. And I mean that sincerely. Prey, and even more Mooncrash, are games that should have revolutionized the gaming industry and inspired millions. Arcane Studios, please don't give up on this IP and the amazing ideas and world you have created. There is something here that's so special, and if a sequel does one day come out worthy to this predecessor, I fully believe it will live on in people's memories forever. But as always, thank you guys so much for watching. The support means the world to me. And let me know down below what games and series you guys want to see next. I really enjoy doing these. And if you want to support me more, make sure to check out the live streams I do right here on this channel every weekend. Or just share the content with friends and family. It helps me out a lot. Until next time.